Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome all uh, Williams Foundation members to today's interview with the Chief of Air Force, uh, Air Marshal Mel Hupfield. Uh, Mel had originally agreed to do our keynote address at a luncheon um, during this month, but because of COVID restrictions, we've had to change uh, our format and he's kindly agreed to do this interview with me today. Welcome, Mel. Thanks, Jeff, and it's, um, it's a great opportunity. Um, it's a little, uh, little more complex than I guess speaking to a live audience, but um, it's a great opportunity and re I really welcome and thank uh, Williams Foundation for the work that they do do for our Air Force, um, for the delivery of air power and also the emerging links that you're, you're strengthening with the Williams Foundation into the Joint Force. And uh, we uh, very much appreciate the effort um, and the dedication from you and your members in the Foundation and the expertise, experience and insights that you bring um, to our narratives. Thank you. Mel, you've been in the job for what, nearly 12 months. I just wonder whether you could just give us a state of the nation of the Air Force and a position on it. Yeah, certainly, Jeff. I'll have a, have a crack. Um, the, um, the Air Force that I uh, took command of uh, when Leo Davies handed, did the handover ceremony with me was uh, a truly world-class Air Force. Um, and I've got my predecessors to thank for that, of course, uh, you, you being one of them. Uh, but even dating back to Angus Houston, who really started to focus in on people as our a key to our capability. Uh, Jeff Shepard really started to get us into and took us through a very uh, important part of our operational history uh, in the modern in the modern environment. Uh, and of course, uh, handing to Mark Binskin, who continued that in the operational space, but then really started to hone in and develop uh, those key aspects of capability that we needed to have delivered. And of course, yourself, um, really the master of of delivering us uh, the platforms and the systems that we needed uh, to bring us and ensure that we had the capabilities we needed to bring forward uh, into the into our uh, modern era. Um, certainly a, a game changing time. Um, and of course, uh, from there handing that to, to Leo Davies, who really started to focus on then how to start to deliver and integrate those capabilities into our joint force. Uh, so that's the platform I've been given. Um, when I came into the job, I tried to sit on my hands. Uh, I think uh, and that was really important. Like the first thing is, you know, this is a great Air Force, don't break it. Um, so that was my initial focus. Uh, did it, we did a lot of work, we've done a lot of review, uh, and we're linking this very strongly to the importance of uh, what the ADF is seeking. And that's strengthening the strategic centre after the first principles review. Uh, so that's allowed us to have a bit of a look as, as to uh, where Air Force sits, what's Air Force's place in the Joint Force, the importance of air power delivery and air power effects into the Joint Force so that we can maximise uh, the, the value and the proposition that, that Air Force provides uh, into the Joint Force, but also for whole of government. So that's uh, you know where we're sitting at the moment, it's where we've come from, and we're now working on the next steps is where we're going to, and that's uh, I think what we'll get a chance to talk to today is a bit about the Air Force strategy that's emerging and, and our strategy to move forward uh, and where do we take Air Force in the next hundred years? Well, I think that's a that's a good link. It's a it's a great summary of where you're where you're at at the moment. Move back on to more of a strategy discussion. I just wonder whether you'd like to outline what your top five priorities are for Air Force mm. going forward. Yeah, the um, uh, five priorities are really um, centred on our lines of effort within that. So the uh, lines of effort on the strategy, and I'll, I'll come to those again in a moment. But uh, I think um, the 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 first sort of three key areas uh, of importance to me uh, are linked to our enterprise risks. Uh, they'd be no different to when you were in the job. Um, and they are workforce, ICT and infrastructure. Uh, so uh, uh, workforce, there is a line of effort in the, in the Air Force strategy that does get to that. And I've mentioned that already about uh, um, uh, continuing to develop our skilled and intelligent workforce. Uh, ICT, you know, that's, that's part of our key warfighting networks, uh, particularly at the high classified end, so secret and, and above. Uh, so that becomes a really important capability that we have to work uh, through with the Chief of Joint Capabilities and indeed the other um, agencies to deliver on, on our ICT networks so that, that we can, uh, unencumbered, uh, uh, be able to fight in a highly contested, congested and competitive uh, space. And that's not just at the high end, of course, that's once again in that grey zone, uh, in that area of competition. So uh, that capability becomes really important to us. Um, infrastructure, uh, 
that's a continuing um, challenge for us. Um, aging infrastructure across the national um, na uh, the national area uh, is is one thing that the, the government as a whole is looking at. And from an air force perspective, uh, we we in effect fight from our garrison. Um, I know that's an army term, but we fight from our air bases. It's where we we deliver and uh, we project air power. Uh, I can send a C seventeen from Amberley, and it can deliver air power effects into the Middle East. And it, and it can do that from Amberley. We need to make sure all of our air bases are set up and structured, including the appropriate um, priorities to some of the, uh, the air bases. And you know, what do we want to do with those? How do we want to work those? And how do we then start to look at mobile infrastructure and how do we, how do we deliver on that in a more agile way? Uh, that's work that's still to come, uh, but that will, will sort of come out um, with the longer term uh, review of infrastructure. Uh, within that, the, uh, the next priority I think will continuing priority is our transition. So uh, yes, delivered. I've been delivered a great Air Force with great capabilities, but we're halfway through delivering those F-35. The P-8's getting close to de being delivered. Uh, you know, we'll shortly be at full operating capability. Um, but we've got more systems still to come in some areas, so we're still in transition into that, you know, that modern next generation Air Force. So transition which then comes back across all of those things I've just spoken about, relates to workforce, ICT, infrastructure, um, delivering those as we transition our, our capabilities further uh, into the future. Uh, and the, the, uh, the fifth priority, and you always, we always seem to get asked for the top five, um, there's many more, but the, probably the next one is about how we actually um, deliver on our culture um, and um, our behaviour in terms of working as a continuously operating Air Force and understanding the implications of that into the strategic environment. And uh, so all those really, really tie together to our Air Force um, strategy and the lines of effort within them. Great. Look, can, can I just take you back onto one uh, workforce? Mm -hmm. Because uh, certainly five or six years ago, it, it was an area that I thought we could actually extract more capability out of the Air Force uh, with larger crewing ratios and, mm -hmm. and um, other areas like Air base support. I just wonder what your thoughts are on the size of the Air Force relative to what possible jobs you might have to do. Yeah, I think um, it's it's probably about right size now, given the capabilities that we have. Um, I can see a potential for increasing tasking, uh, and uh, and indeed in some of our capabilities, um, the ability to project force, um, persistence. Uh, yeah, that they will require capabilities that, are, that that will probably require increased rates of effort, and what that that can be done in a number of ways. Uh, but certainly, one key aspect to it will be workforce and how many people you have um, to deliver on the capabilities, to maintain and sustain capabilities, and be able to repeat them and continue to flow them out. Um, if you want ubiquity and more presence everywhere, then you, obviously you need more platforms. But certainly, rates of effort and generating the amount of air power we need, a lot of that is in workforce. And if that needs to increase, then of course we would be, be needing to start to think about increasing the size of the workforce. Uh, that is work that we're doing under the current um, um, environment so that we can understand what the strategic environment will look like in the future, and what we need to be able to do to constantly operate, um, how is the circumstances changing, how do we think they'll evolve, and do we need to continue to build and, and perhaps seek uh, uh, increased resourcing from government uh, based on workforce. Um, I think at the moment, the way I would be looking to to make the most and get the most out of the people we have, and that's my first responsibility. You know, I can't go to government and say, look, I need more people, mm. give me 5,000 more, more people in Air Force. I can't do that unless I've um, demonstrated that we are using the people we have to the best effect possible. And I think there is work to do on that. Uh, that's part of the line of effort of, of, of developing a and intel you know, continuing to develop an intelligent, skilled workforce um, so that we, we make sure we've got the right people with the right skills in the right place um, at the right time. Uh, so we've got to be able to anticipate and plan and build and educate um, for that. Uh, importantly then, we, um, we need to take advantage of things like uh, artificial intelligence where it makes sense to do so. So we don't want to be doing um, mundane number crunching on workforce numbers or financial accounting, uh, if uh, checking forms that you've put the leave form in and that you've filled all the fields out correctly. 
if that sort of information can be done through artificial intelligence and digitising our work, then we can free up personnel from doing those tasks, for example, and then put them into more, you know, the more important tasks that we might have, and I can prioritise those for it. And there's a whole host of initiatives and innovations I think that we could achieve um, to, to deliver some of those outcomes across uh, our defence business, not just Air Force, and in that way um, make better use of the people that we've got. I think that that's a really challenging innovation for us in the future. For, for sure, and I, I think that's a great approach. I, I just always sort of hark back that a, a lot of our crew ratios were set back in the 1980s mm. in, in a very different environment. And when you look at the reliability of the platforms that we've got at the moment, um, it probably serviceable aeroplanes won't be a limitation. It'll yeah. be the number of crews you've actually got. So I think going forward, it's probably an area that needs, yeah, needs to be looked at. And I, yeah, I think um, uh, crew ratio certainly is uh, for that continuously operating max sustained effort. That's where we'll start to drive home what it, what it is that we have enough. Look, let, let me just move on to another area here. Um, the Air Force has been relatively well positioned in terms of industrial participation. You know, if I think about the current national sovereignty argument, we've we've always had a very uh, robust maintenance, repair and overhaul inside inside country. And with the F-35 program, uh, we actually extended to, to um, manufacture of parts of that aeroplane. Um, but there is a move for more uh, Australian manufacture of equipment. Um, how do you see that manifesting itself in Air Force? Yeah, um, well, in, in Air Force, Certainly, with our key partners, like CASG in particular, but industry itself, um, you know, I think it's a positive outcome. Uh, as long as we maintain a rational and um, deliberate approach to, to how we would prioritise for it, uh, COVID nineteen has demonstrated to us the importance of supply chains, and when we rely so heavily on global supply chains, um, any breakdown in those impacts directly our capability. So I would welcome opportunity to. Uh, assure our supply chains um, through um, capabilities with, that, that are resident within the Australian industry. So I think uh, you know, those aspects are a really positive outcome for Air Force um, because that helps us to deliver the air power capabilities we need. Um, I still would though want to recognise that capabilities such as F-35, uh, you know, exquisite capabilities, exquisite platforms, uh, some of those capabilities I think we will always be uh, looking to particularly the US as a key partner. Um, you know, the KC-30, uh, what a wonderful aircraft that is, and you know, that's an Airbus product from Europe. So we'll still be looking to buy those sort of uh, pieces of equipment, those platforms off the shelf. Um, and indeed, I think um, from a, an effectiveness perspective for our industry, that's probably a, a, a good way of doing it. But where we, where we gain the benefit is, as you've said, F-35, uh, you know, positioning our Australian industry um, colleagues to be competitive, to compete for work, to be competitive to then provide for sustainment, uh, assure those supply chains, uh, those supply lines. That's where it becomes really important to us. Um, and the F-35 program, you know, I started Air 6000, Project Air 6000 when I was a wing commander. Um, back in 1998 that project started. Uh, it wasn't my thoughts that did it, but one of my successes that was running that project then started to work through the industry components to it way back then, you know, in around 2000, uh, to prepare industry for what was needed. I'd argue that we were too late even for that. And you can see the success, you know, 1.7 billion or so worth of worth of business for Australian industry in the F-35 program. I think eventually up to 5 billion. Yeah, yeah the, the, the growth is still, you know, we'll see what happens after mm. COVID-19. One thing that's certain is defence is not going out of business anytime soon. Uh, you know, the uncertainty in the strategic environment is a clear indicator of that. So, you know, that sort of progress, the need to still build those industries to support those capabilities and indeed to support the global supply of that of those sort of pieces of, uh, of equipment um, will be essential. So, so I think, you know, there's, the sky's the limit. What's our imagination now of innovate, innovation and collaboration with the industry that gives us an opportunity to build that? You can see that um, at the moment with our uh, initiative with Boeing on the Law Wingman. Now, I'm cautious here. I, you know, the concept and idea around Law Wingman is a very strong and important concept. It's about manned and unmanned teaming, about 
bringing a capability forward that will further enhance our air combat capabilities. Yeah, I like the loyal wingman, but I'm not after that platform that you saw in a glossy brochure. What I'm after is the systems, uh, the technology that underpins it. Um, how do we put a self-manoeuvring aircraft around an F-35 or send it in by itself uh, in a swarm? Uh, it's those sort of characteristics that this program will deliver for us and um, that we can collaboratively work with Boeing. Um, the US are doing similar work, the UK are doing similar work. I'd encourage other elements of industry to get on board with this. They will probably have a, a part in what will become a more expanded law wingman program. There'll be some benefits out of that actual platform that you've seen that Boeing have put forward on, on, the, you know, on the initial launch. Uh, and we can use those to test and, and adjust but it's about what's coming next that's the most exciting bit for me, I think. Um, Law Wingman is the stepping stone for that, and that's where I'd see it sit. Yeah, certainly. But I, I think just the, uh, the visibility of actually building an aircraft with 35 industry partners, uh, I think, is exciting. And yeah, I don't disagree with you. I think, you know, the artificial intelligence and the systems that go in it are absolutely important. But uh, the other concept that I do like behind it is that they're trying to do it to a cost. Mm. Uh, which which means you can lose the aircraft without a lot of damage to your full, full structure. Yeah. yeah, and it has to be an affordable solution. Uh, and where do we want to trade off risk? Uh, what, yeah, that's where it sits. And uh, yeah, I'm sure that um, if you look at the Law Wingman program, don't be mistaken here, the Law Wingman isn't a mini F-35. Mm. You know, it's, it's not got the capabilities that are resident you know, very expensive, exquisite platform in the F-35, um, very capable platform and, and very much value for money in that regard. Uh, but the Law Wingman could get to that point, but where's your trade-offs? Yeah, and that's the sort of thing that we want to have a look at so that it can still deliver that high-end capability that we might need, but it can be affordable to be expendable. Uh, and we're not putting pink bodies in a grey aeroplane here, um, but we're using pink bodies to operate it, to still provide the discipline for engagement and how we actually employ a system like that, so that we still we still do it in accordance with laws of armed conflict. That's a lot of work to get done to understand how we do it. So I really welcome that from the Australian industry. Um, another part of Australian industry, uh, Jeff, if I may, is um, you know what's emerging in the space domain. You mentioned mm -hmm. that earlier, uh, and that's a very exciting opportunity. Australian industry is starting to get into play on that. Uh, we have to understand what it is that our government wants us to achieve. Um, you asked me what my thoughts were for the space domain moving forward and there's uh, a whole number of opportunities that we can deliver here and in, in concert with industry, um, uh, ranging, ranging through um, space domain awareness um, to, to... Rocket engines and... Yeah, yeah. You know, the hypersonic work yeah. that's going on. I mean, the, the limit of our imagination, really. Uh, our program of Jericho, which you in fact started, um, yeah, we're revisiting that in our strategy as well. Uh, there's some people that thought that Jericho was our strategy and it's not, it's part of the plan, it's part of our, it's our innovation program to deliver on um, where we wanted to take Air Force. So we're making sure that's very clear. And the new program of work for Jericho has a unique, unique balance um, of uh, being able to deliver um, projects that are achievable and deliverable. And we're giving one stars in Air Force the responsibility to take those projects up and deliver them be the sponsor for that particular Jericho um, program of work. Uh, but without curtailing the blue sky opportunities in Jericho, you know, to still be agile and disruptive and innovative, that's true innovation, start to bring forward options that we might not have thought of. But once again, it's not just about the people when, when I talk about those aspects, and this is where Australian industry can help us as well. It's not, it's, sorry, it's not just about the platforms, it's about the people as well, so innovative programs to build, develop, support, sustain our people. I always thought the best part of Jericho was actually giving our people permission to think differently. Yes. About what they've got to do. Look, uh, let me just move back on the F-35. I noticed the other day, one of our aeroplanes in Hill had actually achieved 1,000 hours, mm. which is uh, which is quite a quite a milestone. I just wonder whether you'd just give us a few words on how that introduction is going. Still early days for the yeah. F-35 and what everybody's impression Yeah, Yeah, um, it's going well, I think. Um, and certainly yeah, having an aeroplane that's got a thousand hours on it, still in the state, still part of the initial development and building of the, of the capability, compared to I think what we had with the F-18 when we first mm. bought it brand new, we were at the front edge of the 
capability. You know, the US Marine Corps have been flying them, the Brits are flying them, there's FMS customers around the world operating F-35. We're getting a really good understanding about the system, and not just through our own use, but from the broader international community. A very successful program. Within Australia, um, I have to be cautious on the numbers here, and I think it's 20 odd now that we actually own a state aircraft, we've got about 20 in Australia. We're getting more that will be delivered shortly. COVID-19 has slowed us down a little, uh, obviously. Um, that, but that's understandable. Yeah, yeah. international borders yeah. are closed, but we're working through those and we, we've got mitigations in place now. Uh, and we're, we're seeking as we all, as all nations start to get a, a handle on COVID-19, then uh, finding the way that we can still deploy our people, um, air crew and technicians and support staff to pick up the next round of F-35s and bring them home. Uh, and then uh, as we build that, you know, by the end of the year, you know, driving towards our initial operating capability, we're, we're close. We, we might have impacts because of COVID yet to be determined, uh, but the program is, is coming along uh, very well. And uh, you know, putting the aircraft in the hands of the operators, getting them to use it, to employ it, and putting in place the virtual training simulations and the, and the equipment that we need to do that sort of training allows us to expand the envelope. Um, and, and it's going on, on schedule, in fact, in some cases ahead of schedule. One of the other key aspects for F-35 program, uh, as well as the industry pieces we've spoken about, uh, is the planning and build of the infrastructure to support the program. Um, a key, key marker of success. So F-35s and the squadrons that are being formed in, in the appropriate timeline are moving into their new accommodation with all the new ICT communication and networks that they need to operate the system. Uh, They've got all the facilities they need, the secure spaces to actually do the mission planning and development of the capability. Um, I compare that to when I first started flying F-18, F we were working out of World War II buildings at Williamtown. Uh, we did that for the first year in the squadron. Uh, we weren't gonna repeat that, uh, those errors a second time. So uh, the, the program is moving forward successfully, it's been well planned, it's been well executed now. There will be challenges, there will remain challenges as we continue to develop the capability. But I'm very confident, certainly the Australian approach, very sound, we've got smart people uh, in the program at all levels. Uh, we will overcome the problems that this aircraft uh, might encounter. And certainly linking that to the international community, uh, great opportunity. Um, and I think it's going to, it will be a world leading, it is already a world leading capability. So you've got a heavy bunch of fighter pilots? Very, yeah, very. Uh, having said that, though, there's uh, there's ones that are still flying the classic Hornet. There's one flying Super Hornet. One flying one's flying Growler. They're all equally passionate about the system they operate. What's re what's really important is how those systems all integrate, and we're seeing and doing that now, and we're practicing that. And we've got F-35s with classic Hornets and Super Hornets and Growlers tied in with the AW and C. We are integrating our air force, and we're providing that integration into the joint force. It's a great opportunity. And I think it's something the public don't often realise. We both started flying the Hornet back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And I looked, the aeroplane still looked the same. But when I left, it was certainly a very different platform to the yeah. one I started started on some 20 plus years yeah. earlier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I suspect you're in the same case. And that's what we'll see with the F-35 as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I started flying the F-18 in uh, 1986. Right. Um, and in those, another example of where we've come a lot further forward in terms of how we, how we deliver and introduce the service, uh, we pretty much jumped out of the Mirage straight onto the Hornet and we started operating the, the Hornet as a Mirage with better weapons. We're not doing that with F-35. We, we are employing the F-35 as it's designed to be employed. Uh, this is a great step forward for us. And we've been able to do that because we, we did actually make good decisions about the F-18 when we, when we acquired it. And we've delivered and updated that system all the way through, kept it current, relevant, contemporary. Uh, and the tactics versus the, the nature of threats that we might see out there um, in a training sense um, have allowed us to really build our expertise across our air combat capability. That's placed us well to deliver F-35 and I'm sure we will do the similar a similar approach and, and even better with F-35 as we move into the the, that generation of, of air combat capability and, and indeed as we move forward into our next 100 years of Air Force. No, no thanks. Well, that, that's a good point. 100 year uh, anniversary, um, 
next year mm. coming up. We've had to slide Avalon because of uh, COVID COVID nineteen. Um, yeah. You want to give us uh, some insight into what you've got planned for the hundred years? Yeah. So um, yeah, the Avalon was going to be the curtain raiser for us. Um, but uh, unfortunately, that's been now moved to the end of the year to give us certainty that we can still achieve it. it it's a it's a major event internationally. It's a key uh, industry and international engagement opportunity. Um, and I and I will come at the end to my lines of effort for our Air Force strategy. You know, that's you know, international engagement is a key part of that. But the um, throughout the year in Air Force 2021, uh, which is what we're calling the the centenary year, uh, we'll be starting with a with an opening, we'll find another way to open the birthday year at the start of the year. Uh, we'll have a major celebration uh, on the 31st of March, which is the Air Force birthday, as, as of course you'd know. Um, and that will include uh, ideally a colours parade if we can open up, if the restrictions are in such a place COVID-19 wise, that we can we can do a colours parade that, that will, will provide a, a new colour for the Air Force uh, and, and celebrate throughout that part of the year and as we move towards Avalon, regional events all around the country, um, bringing in to all those people that, that, uh, un that so they can understand and contribute to what Air Force does and, and, uh, and where our place in, in the Joint Force is. Uh, but throughout that year, we'll be really looking to honour um, the service and sacrifice of those that came before us. Uh, we'll be looking to um, showcase the capabilities that we currently possess, that force in being. Um, and that demonstrates then in, in, in understanding the capabilities we currently have, it allows us to do a very clear um, indication and, and demonstration of our transition to our future force. Uh, and that's the, the third part of the, the uh, centenary is to look at what's coming next, what's our future look like? Um, F-35s, um, UAVs, unmanned uh, uh, vehicles, sp the space domain, what's, what's coming next? Where's it going to go? What, what will Air Force look like for the next 100 years? And what are we doing to set ourselves up to be on the right vector to support that? And uh, that's really the focus that we'll have next year. All right, look, and I take an opportunity here just to correct an earlier error, Jeff. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think I mentioned that we had 10 C-17s. That's purely wishful thinking on my part. <laughs> Um, I, I'm sure that was uh, you achieved the growth to it to eight. It is eight. Um, and ten, ten would be nice. Ten would be nice, but uh, the secretary would really get stuck into me if I was to be out there seeking to get more air mobility. You know, I have to prioritise our capabilities for Air Force across the Joint Force, and we're doing that very, very effectively. I think through the the uh, investment committee and the, the structures we have now around the strategic centre. So, uh, you know, if I can articulate an argument for it. And indeed, if there's a demonstrated need, then yeah, maybe we'll get to 10 one day. But at the moment, it's eight. Um, and certainly, yeah, we have 12 C-130s that, that we, we uh, have as the total number and 10 C-27s. They're the numbers we've got at the moment. Um, so as you say, the way we can increase the um, capacity of that as an example in terms of the air mobility workforce or air mobility um, delivery uh, is by increasing uh, crew numbers. Uh, so, you know, trade-offs, uh, rationalisation, balance and priorities across our workforce, that's the sort of work that I have to do to understand um, where I'll need to compromise, balance uh, and, and or renew the skills that we need in different areas. And uh, crew ratios, I think, are a really important part of uh, capacity moving forward. No, no, I think, uh, I think that's a, a great, great approach.